Welcome back. Here we are for our final lab of the semester. Congratulations for making it this far. But can't rest on your laurels just yet. You have this lab to do and the lab exam and your final exam. So keep pushing. We're almost there. Now, of course, usually for this lab, we'd be on campus. We'd be over in the stadium classroom building and we'd be doing these analyses on each other. Unfortunately, we can't do that, but we're going to make the best of it through this video. So off we go. Here's the outline. Um, as usual, we'll start off with some background information. And then in this lab, we're going to talk about six different measurement techniques. The body mass index and the waist to hip ratio are more general body composition measures. And then we'll talk about four different techniques of assessing body fat. Okay, here we go. Now, I know you've talked about this with Dr. Thompson. I just think it's nice to have a review. Um, you know, the more times we can go through something, the more likely it's going to stick in our brain. So there is no harm, that's for sure. So make sure you review these definitions. Of course, there's body weight, which is our total mass. So someone is 150 pounds, their total mass or body weight is 150 pounds. But body weight in itself as a number only gives us some information. That total body mass doesn't tell us about what type of body mass it is, how much muscle versus fat, for example. So it's helpful to have more information. So of that total body mass, it can be helpful to understand the body composition of that mass. In other words, how much of that mass is lean tissue? How much of that mass is fat mass? And those are the two types of mass that we are most concerned with in terms of looking at body composition. There's lean mass, that's muscles, bones, organs, and these are things that we need, okay? And then there's fat mass, and as the name indicates, that is their adipose or fat tissue. Of course, we need some fat. We know that fat helps, because we talked about it in this class, as a matter of fact, in lab number two, we know that dietary fat can help us to protect, insulate, cushion in, within our body. Fat is also a component of our cell membranes. And we, of course, use some fat for energy reserves. So we need some, but as we all know, sometimes too much can have detrimental effects. And then you can see on the right here, our total mass or our body weight is going to be equal to our lean mass plus our fat mass. So of the 150 pounds, maybe 130 pounds are lean mass and then 20 pounds are fat mass. 130 lean plus 20 fat equals 150 total mass. Now, I wanna talk a little bit more about fat. I just basically told you that, but let's give some names. So we established that we need some fat. And here are some of the functions that I just told you. We need some fat, makes up cell membranes, protection. It does help to form some hormones, etc. So the fat that we need is termed essential fat. And then the other type of fat is called storage fat, the fat that is not essential. Everyone's going to have some of both, okay? We're going to have some essential. We're going to have some storage. Um, ideally, you want to minimize the storage to not be excessive, um, but it's perfectly fine to have some of both. On the right, this is from the Jake and Droop text that you use in lecture. These are some healthy amounts of how much of your total fat should be essential versus storage, but you don't need to know those numbers um, for this lab, as far as I'm concerned. But you should know the difference. Essential fat is a type of fat in our body that we absolutely need. It's, it, it's physiologically necessary. And then our storage fat is our non-essential fat. And then we can take it even a little further. We can talk about two different types of storage fat. We have the storage fat, commonly called adipose, 
We have this in the viscera. Viscera is just a fancy word for saying our, our insides, our gut. So the visceral fat is the fat that's in and around your abdomen. And then the subcutaneous fat is the fat under our skin. So make sure you can understand those terms. Here we can see some pictures that give us a little bit of more information. So on our left, we can see we're always going to have some fat in and around the organs of the abdomen. So if we were to look at this picture, we're looking at visceral fat, visceral fat in our gut. The, the person here on the left has maybe a, a more normal or quote unquote healthy amount of visceral fat. But an excessive amount of visceral fat would look like this. Not only is there extra fat here in the abdomen between the skin and the organs, but there's also extra fat in between the organs. And both of these, the visceral fat, can lead to a host of problems. I also want to point out here on the right, you know, men and women naturally tend to carry their fat a little bit differently. Men, maybe you've heard that men are apple-shaped, pretty generic thing to say, but it is a good visual. Men tend to carry more of their fat in their upper body, in their chest or abdomen, whereas women are more likely to be pear-shaped or carry more of their fat in their hips. Is one worse than the other? In some instances, yes. In some instances, no. Just important to point out the difference. All right, now let's get right down to it. Let's talk about some of these body composition techniques. And I have this woman on the right pointing at you. Yes, she's pointing at you. Because this is information you, I'm pointing to you even though you can't see me, this is information you can use. So I know a lot of you are phys ed majors. A lot of you are in the exercise science program. A lot of you maybe are a coach of a team or you're involved in athletics. In all those fields, knowing how to perform body composition assessments is going to be a feather in your cap. This is something that you can put on your resume. This is something you can say that you know how to do. These are skills that you have, and you're going to know them well, and this can be an, something that's very advantageous for you. Okay, so this is something you can actually take with you and you can use. We're going to first talk about some of the body composition techniques, BMI, which you've already heard of, and waist to hip ratio, which you may have, you should have, but let's talk about both. Now remember, these two body composition assessments are not body fat percentage. I know that by this point in the semester, you're not gonna make the rookie move of thinking that body mass index is the same as body fat percentage because it's not. So these first two are not body fat percentage, but they can still give us some if limited, some information. Let's talk about BMI. You know about body mass index. Just pause for a drink there, I'm sorry. Body mass index is basically a number that is a number about your weight in relationship to height. So it's a number from a height weight chart. You've probably seen the chart. We've got a nice picture of it here. You can also calculate body mass index by using a formula. So for this lab, we're gonna have you do both. They should become similar, of course, but it's good to do the formula to get a more specific number or in instances where someone, their weight or their height doesn't show on the chart, uh, then you can't do it from the chart. At least we have the formula. To do the formula, we can see here it's weight in kilograms divided by height in meters squared. The conversions that you need are on the right. In the past, we've done conversions from height in inches to centimeters, 
but pay attention when we're converting inches to meters, it's not 2.54 like it was for to find centimeters. In this case, you're using your height in inches times 0 0.0254, and that'll give you height in meters. And make sure you square the height in meters before dividing the weight into it. Everyone knows how to use the chart. Quick review, you find your height in inches. I will use myself, I'm about 5'9". And then you find your weight in pounds. Of course, these are 10 pound increments, so it's not great. I'm between 150 and 160. So I'd come across here and I'd come across here and I would probably say I am 23. And looking at the bottom, we can see according to that, I would be considered a healthy weight. What are some of the pros and cons of body mass index? I already know you know these things. I'll go through a list quickly just to review, but you already know this. What are the pros? What are the positive things of body mass index? It's free and it's easy. That's all I got, free and easy. What are some of the cons? If you notice the chart, it doesn't take into account gender. It doesn't take into account age. So it's not very specific. Other cons, it doesn't take into consideration body composition. Case in point, we have two dudes. Both dudes are six feet and 210 pounds. These two dudes are the same height and the same weight. And because of the same height and the same weight, they're going to show up to be the same BMI. But obviously, they have very different compositions. And that is one of the biggest limitations of BMI. It doesn't take into account what type of weight. You know, muscle weighs more than fat. So someone may be a little bit higher in weight because they're muscular, but it ends up showing that they're overweight according to the chart. So very limited accuracy, but because it's cheap and easy, it's used a lot in um, epidemiology where you have a lot of subjects, tens of thousands of subjects that you wanna get information about simply because it's so many people. Uh, and it's easy and free, they may use BMI. For you, uh, because we're going to be going through these techniques, there's really no excuse to rely solely on this because it is so limited. Okay, number two. Number two, another way we can do body assessment, body composition. And this is really easy, and it's simple, and it still gives us more information than the BMI. So this is a type of anthro, anthrop, anthropometry. How about I can't talk this evening? <laughs> Who knows what's in my glass that I'm drinking, huh, huh? It's just water. Okay, so the waist-to-hip ratio is just as it says. We're measuring the girth of the waist, which is the narrowest point of the body, and we're measuring the girth of the widest part of the hip. And you simply do the measurement of the waist in centimeters divided by the measurement of the hips in centimeters. The idea here is by measuring the girth of these two places and by doing the division, you get a ratio. We're assessing body weight distribution. And these particular sites, the way that mass is distributed between them, can actually give us some information. So it's a simple way of assessing body mass distribution. What are some of the pros? It's easy, relatively so. It's cheap. All it takes is a tape measure. Maybe um, your parents or someone you know has like a old-fashioned sewing tape measure. I mean, if push came to shove, you can also get, um, you know, from the toolbox, get the tape measure. But even if you buy the actual tape measure for this purpose, what is it, $10? This is something you could use and it could give you more information than the BMI. 
What are some of the cons? Well, it's still limited. We're only measuring two sites of the body, which is not necessarily representative of other parts of the body. Okay? The interpretation here is at the bottom. So when you do the division, you do the waist measurement divided by the hips measurement. The interpretation is if females have a ratio greater than 0.8, if males have a ratio greater than 0.91, then that person is at a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. This has been shown through scientific research. The way that body mass is distributed between these two sites can give us some indication of your risk of cardiovascular disease. Okay, we're gonna stop here for a moment and we're gonna skip over to a video where we're gonna see how it's done. Let me go back. So again, using a tape measure, measuring at the narrowest part, making sure that the tape measure is tight or taut. As you can see, I'm helping my trusty assistant make sure it's tight. Then we find the widest part of the hips, a little bit easier in women, but if you just run your hands down on the hips, we can find the widest part in men also. We're also gonna measure in centimeters. Make sure the tape measure is not flipped over. And there we go. I'll post the link to the video so you can laugh at me more if you like. <laughs> there we go. All right. Now we're gonna skip over to body fat percentage. So the first two, BMI and the waist to hip ratio, they were ways of measuring weight relative to height and measuring proportion of weight to the waist to the hip. But to get even more information, we can look at body fat percentage. So going back to the fact that total mass is equal to lean mass plus fat mass, it can give us the most information in terms of body composition to know what percentage of your total mass is made up of fat. And we're gonna discuss four ways of assessing that. Before we do that, just to make sure we're all on the same, all on the same path here, body fat percentage. It's amount of body fat as a percentage compared to total body weight. People always ask the question, what's a healthy body fat percentage? There's not one exact healthy body fat percentage for each person in general. I know Dr. Thompson gives similar ranges in general for college-aged men and women, which you are. A healthy range for college-aged men, body fat between 10 and 20%. A healthy range for college-aged women between 20 and 30%. What if a man is 21%? Is he going to die from a heart attack? No. So these are just healthy ranges. I do want to point out something. I have many friends, and you know, sometimes we'll get in the discussion because you know how women are. We're very self-conscious. And we'll be talking about body fat percentage, and I'll be talking about the lab because you know I go into the bod pod and I get my number and... The bod pod tells me, and as you know, I exercise five or six days a week. The, body, the bod pod tells me I am 26% body fat. And my friends, my female friends, they're like, nah, you can't be 26% body fat. Look at you. And I have to tell them, oh, yes, indeed. I can absolutely be 26%, even 30%, even 32%, and still be healthy for a woman. Right, So some women are surprised at the higher end of that. But there's a physiological reason why. Why do women have naturally a higher body fat percentage? Because the female body is made for one purpose in terms of its fat distribution. To carry, nurture, develop a baby, and then spit it out, and then breastfeed it. So in order for the body to be able to carry a child, we need more body fat. So to, to the women out there, 30% body fat, a little more, a little less, is absolutely normal. 
Men, hope you're listening too. It's absolutely normal. All right. This table on the right here is from your Jake and Droop text. It gives a little bit better of a breakdown, but I'm not going to ask you those specific numbers. You should, however, know the general ranges for what a healthy body fat percentage is for men, for college-age men and college-age women. I have a couple more things to say here on my soapbox. I'm going to move pretty quickly, but I do want to make a couple points. You know, this course is sports nutrition. So we have been focused primarily on athletes. And it's no surprise, body composition, how much body fat someone has as an athlete can absolutely make a difference. Now, we can't necessarily say how much. So it's very difficult to quantify how a couple body fat percentages up or down influences performance in certain athletics. But we can absolutely say for sure, body composition can affect athletic performance for good and for bad. I've given you some examples here. I'm not going to ask you these. But, you know, if we just think about it, there are some types of athletes where a very low body fat percentage is advantageous. Think about a marathon runner. And I'm talking here about elite marathon runners, you know, the ones who were at the Olympic trials. Having a very low body, this would be male, by the way. You wouldn't want a female to be that low. Having a very low body fat percentage for a marathon runner means that it's less weight for them to have to transport all 26.2 miles. In other cases, like gymnasts, obviously having less body fat helps them to be better gymnasts in terms of being able to jump and flip and move. But some of these sports are also subjective in nature. So part of a gymnast score is subjective, how they look, are they graceful and all that. You can see some other examples. Sprinters want a low body fat percentage, but they're not going to be quite as low as marathon runners because they need more power moderate and high. So just an example, we can generally say for certain sports, low, moderate, or maybe higher body fat percentages are are going to be helpful. And this comes from your Jake and Droop text just to give you some ideas. But everyone is different. People are built differently through genetics. So it's not like you need to fit into a box. Can body fat percentage be too low? Absolutely, depending on what text or, re- or what source you use. Some may say below 3% is too low for male. Others may say below 5%. For females, below 10 or maybe even 12%, because it depends. Some people are naturally more lean in structure through genetics. Some are a little bit bigger like I'm I'm not a very lean person. So for me, 12% body fat would be way too low. And you can see some of the risks. So sometimes athletes can get going down the path of trying to get too low. And then they don't have enough body fat for their essential functions. And it could be very dangerous. Okay, enough of that. Let's get into our four techniques that we're going to discuss for measuring body fat percentage. One of them is the bioelectrical impedance analysis unit. Many of you, I'm sure, have used a unit that we have uh, in the phys ed and exercise science department. The one we have on campus is a scale like this where you sit on it, and then there's a cord that attaches the scale to the computer. You step on the scale. Other BIA units you just hold with your hand like this one. Make sure you're reviewing the mechanism behind each method of assessing body fat percentage. In the BIA unit, an electrical current is sent through the body. And because that a current, because that current passes more quickly or more slowly through different types of tissue, how fast or slow that current makes it around the body can give us information on how much fat is in the tissue. All right, pros and cons. 
Um, pros. This is going to give us more information than the BMI, which is just a height weight chart. It's going to give us more information than the waist to hip ratio. So it gives us some information because it's body fat percentage. It's going to give you a breakdown of your total mass, lean mass, and fat mass. Other pros, it's easy to use. Um, and it's relatively inexpensive if you're comparing it to the bod pod. What are the cons? The accuracy is not so great. So one thing that leads to inaccurate measures, the BIA unit is very sensitive to hydration levels. Um, and even if you are similarly hydrated, this is going to have more variability than other measures. Uh, I don't have a video of the BIA unit, unfortunately. Hopefully, a lot of you have used it. Um, but basically, if you use it, you have to step on the scale in your bare feet. Obviously, we want that current to get to your skin, not through socks. You press a button. You're going to put in your age, height, weight, and then you wait. You don't really feel the current going through you at all. You wait a couple seconds, and it's going to give you a little printout of what your body fat percentage is. Let's talk about skin fold. Oh, it looks like some of my pictures did not save. All right. I'm going to pause this video and then download it again for part two to get to the skin fold. Let me go back here. Pause and I'll see you for part two.